praise to God who works for good, whose loving kindness firm has stood, and will through endless ages stand, on every border by His hand, and will through endless ages stand. Well, good morning, and welcome to Hebron this morning on this beautiful long weekend. A special welcome to those of you who are guests or visiting with us this morning. Thank you so much for being here. We hope that you can feel at home and connected as we lift up the name of our God here together in praise this morning. Reminder, you're all invited to stay for a time of coffee and refreshment after the service, just a time when we can be together in fellowship, a time when we can get to know one another even better. I have one announcement for you this morning. Normally, we have, we celebrate the Lord's Supper together on the second Sunday of every month. And so next week is the second Sunday of the month. However, uh, Pastor Elizabeth is going to be away next Sunday. She'll be on vacation. So we're going to push communion back by one week. We're gonna celebrate together on August 20th instead. So there's a note about that in the update. I just wanted to say it out loud for you again this morning. We'll be celebrating communion together on August 20th. It's at this time our God calls us to worship, so I invite you to rise as you're able. And our God calls us to worship through the words of the psalmist in Psalm 100, where we read, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his holy name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Will you join us as we sing together this morning? Build your kingdom here. Come set, come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope 
like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. We seek, we seek your kingdom first. We are to worship in this place, we also are welcomed with grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we have been called and welcomed, I invite you to now turn to one another and extend the same welcome of grace and peace. Let's continue to lift up our God in worship together. All glory be to Christ. Survive unless the Lord does raise the 
house in vain its builders strive to you who boast to morrow's gain tell me what is your Oh 
peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand besides The psalmist models a transparent faith with these words. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We express our longing for God's leading through our own transparent confession. So I invite you to join me as we pray. God of our hearts, we come to you, admitting that we are lost in our lives that can be so chaotic. We have lost our peace. In our selfishness, we have lost our ability to care for others. In our self-reliance, we have lost our total dependence on you. Heavenly Father, forgive us when we are lost and when we do not seek those who are also lost. Forgive us when we harden our hearts and do not understand the magnitude and the depth of your love. We ask for your forgiveness and mercy for our wandering hearts. Remind us that it is by your grace we are found and lead us with your Holy Spirit to receive this grace and offer it to others as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. People of God, hear the good news. In Hebrews 10, the pastor writes this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his blood. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Thanks be to our God. I invite you to rise again as you're able as we sing of this faith that we can hold on to. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sins have all been torn. In the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast it shall never be removed. Christ the sure and steady anchor 
When temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won, deeper still than goes the anchor. Though I trust thee, stand accused. I will hold fast to the anchor. It shall the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief hopeless somehow oh my soul now lift your eyes to Calvary this my palace of assurance see his love forever proved I will the sure and steady anchor as we face the wave of death when these trials give way to glory as we draw our final breath we will cross that great horizon clouds behind and life secure and the calms will be the this time out of a response to this grace we have freely received through Christ, we have an opportunity to respond in giving. And this morning, uh, as the same with every morning, we have two opportunities for giving. We have a first offering, which is for Hebron and its ministries, and we have a second special offering. And this morning's special offering cause is for our missionaries. Um, please turn your eyes now to the screens as we have a video from the new missionary director in Guatemala. Hi. Spanish. I've been living in Guatemala for almost uh, 24 years. I came to volunteer only for six months, but I love the country so much that I decided to stay. I've been here for so many years now. I'm married to a Guatemalan woman. And we have a daughter, 14 years old, and we live in Antigua. I wanted to work for World Renew because mainly two things. One is the Christian principles the organization has. And the second one is that uh, we have partners, real partners. We, we don't, don't just uh, fund organization. We are very close follow up, we provide technical advice, we are very close to them. So we want these partners to be stronger and stronger so they become really important organizations in the country and that's our role, to make them important for the country and important for people they serve. What I most like of the program is that uh, it's very flexible. Uh, even if we have a, a strategic plan that is worldwide used by the organization, it gives us a lot of flexibility so we can have different approaches from our partners to, to work on the same topics like food security, 
or uh, community health. Uh, so uh, different approaches can be approved. So we are very innovative. Uh, it's very interesting to, to see all these new ideas that our partners bring to be successful in the work they do in the communities. What I would expect for our staff in Guatemala and the program is that our staff that uh, they flourish. This is one of our values, organization values. We like to see them growing up as professionals. They are very professional already, but I would like to see them growing even more. Uh, and for the program, I would like to see stronger uh, partners, a stronger program, and that we grow and that we can reach more and more population in it. We we'll beg you to pray for us in a way that we can uh, make wise decisions about the program, about uh, our work in Guatemala, so we can have a bigger impact on the population uh, most in need. So please pray for us so we can be successful reaching out uh, more and more population in need. Thank you very much for all your support. Uh, without your support, we couldn't do anything in Guatemala. So we are a team, churches, and world renew in Guatemala. And we need to work together. We need your support. So please keep on supporting all our work in Guatemala. Thank you so much. So at this time, it's my pleasure to lead you in congregational prayer. Will you pray with me? God, our Father, who art in heaven, while we slept last night, you were awake, sustaining our world, protecting us, and readying a new day. Lord Jesus, you hold us in the palms of your hands, strong hands, compassionate hands, firm hands, hands that heal, hands that are nail-scarred still, now and forever, such as the duration of your love. And Holy Spirit, our comforter, generous and powerful, you gift and equip us with all things necessary to live today for the glory of you, the triune God, and to our joy. We praise you for who you are. We thank you for all your good gifts to us. Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. We thank you for the mission trip to Guyana and look forward to updates about the ways that you are at work there. Thank you for bringing the team home safely. We pray that the sports camp at the end of the month would be a blessing to you and to your people. Be with the leaders as they prepare to lead and with the campers that they may have ears to hear the good news of your gospel. Lord, we also lift up those in our community who cannot be with us this morning. Wilma, Meta, Brian, Roly, Grace, Pat, Audrey, Jackie, and a few others, Lord. Fill them with a sense of your presence this morning. Give us today our daily bread. Give us ears to hear as your word is read and is preached be with Pastor Phil as he preaches. Bless us in hearing your word and speak truth in the meditations of our hearts. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen.
Our scripture today is taken from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30 and 36 to 43, the parable of the weeds. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the weeds sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned, Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Are there, are there kids here that would like to come up for a quick children's message today? I'd, if you guys can all come up, um, we'll just talk quickly about this lesson that we just learned. Come on down, guys. Mercy, come on. Can you grab that and bring it up here for me? Thanks. Oh, is there anybody? Oh, two. Okay. <laughs> it's vacation week, huh? Okay. Let me get out of my gear here. Okay. Do you guys have a garden? Yes, I think you guys are gardeners. What is a problem that you sometimes have with a garden? Too many weeds. Yeah. How about these guys out here? How many of you guys have a garden? Yeah? Would you say weeds is the number one problem? Yeah? Okay, so what do you do? What do your moms and dads do when you have weeds in your garden? You pull them. Okay. Anything else, Mark? What, what else do they do with weeds? The weeds can distract you, yeah? Can the weeds kind of kill the good plants sometimes? Yeah, yeah, if you let the weeds grow too much? You know, today in Jesus' story, he talked about two different types of seed, okay? One was the good, and one was like the weeds, Right? Now, Jesus' story, he said a man went and planted good seed. And who was that supposed to be like? What's that supposed to be like? Jesus, right, mercy, okay? And the bad seed was like, who planted that? Satan, right. So Jesus was telling a story kind of about the kingdom of God. He said, you know, we have, we are the good seed, those that, that are part of the kingdom of God and love Jesus, we're the good seed that God planted, but we still have to live 
with a lot of bad seed around us. Now, what could be the solution? What could we do with that? People that maybe don't know Jesus or don't follow God's ways. Should we just get rid of them all? Pull them up? No. Jesus said, let them be. And I will take care of it at the end. But you know, like we talked about, weeds sometimes can make good seed kind of weak. It can destroy the good plants. So how can a plant stay strong? What does a plant need to stay strong? Yeah, Mark. It needs to be protected. Who do you think can protect Christians? Who can protect us? God. Okay. What else does a plant need to stay strong? Water. Okay. Soil. Sun. We need all of those things to grow really strong. What grows under the ground? Roots. To grow strong roots underground. So Jesus was saying, don't get rid of the bad seed, but he also needs us to stay strong. The ways we can stay strong are by staying in God's word, reading it, knowing what he wants us to do, by asking God for help and for protection, like Mark said. Okay? These are all ways that we can stay strong even when we're living among the weeds sometimes. Okay? Let's have a prayer, and then you can go back to your parents. Okay? Dear Jesus, thank you that you are the master and the king of your kingdom. We just pray that you help us to stay strong in this world where so many people don't believe in you and don't follow you. Help us to be that, that good seed, shining your light and growing deep roots. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You can go back to your parents. Morning, everyone. I think after that scripture reading and children's story, I said, boy, you got about three quarters of the message already done. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. So uh, before I begin, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you a, a funny story because it came to mind this morning. Uh, some things as you get older just remind you of things. Do you ever notice that, that something happens and you go, oh yeah, remember that? So uh, this morning I was reminded of, I think it was either my first or my second sermon ever. And the reason I was reminded is because at my home church when I was going through, for my bachelor's degree, the, one of the ways that I supported myself was uh, the church graciously appointed me one of the church caretakers. So I, uh, you know, got the mop floors and polish things and clean up things and do all those things. And so, and then one day they, they asked me to preach when I was very young and still in my bachelor's degree and there was this big wooden pulpit and there was a shelf. And I knew there was always a glass of water on the shelf because that uh, was my job to put that glass of water there for the preacher. So I put it there and I came up. I got so excited because it was my first sermon that I, I went like this in the middle of it and I knocked the glass of water over, but it just fell over on the side a little bit, and I picked it right up right away and hoped nobody noticed and kept on preaching. And then the water went all the way around the back of the pulpit, came down, and it found the hole where the cord went down to where all the microphone and everything was, and then you started to hear drip, drip. And then I said, I looked down and I said, boy, some preachers in this church are really messy. Please don't tell the caretaker. I, I say that this morning because I got myself a glass of water. I put it on the floor there uh, just before the service started, and I knocked it over. So if you come over and there's a big puddle on the wall, on the floor, please don't tell the caretaker I did it. So something amazing's been happening in uh, the world lately. How, how many people have gone to the movie theater lately? 
couple. Okay, did you see Barbie or Oppenheimer? Both. Barbieheimer. It's a, it's a big thing. How many people have heard of Barbieheimer? So uh, the movie industry and all the theaters have been really struggling, especially post-COVID and through COVID, you know, people coming out to the theaters and like many businesses, they're trying to recover. But they've had the best couple weeks the last week, not only in Canada, not only in the United States, but worldwide, because two blockbuster movies came out on the same weekend. Barbie, which I probably won't see, and Oppenheimer, which I probably will see, except it's three hours and four minutes, which is kind of long for a movie. But uh, one's historical and one's fantasy. But, but all of a sudden, on social media, it became this big thing that you had to see both of them. And then the big debate, what order did you see them in? One to, to, to make you feel not so great, and then the other one to make you feel great? Or what did it say about you if you looked at so Barbie, so Barbenheimer, in the parlance of today's social media. Well, the movie Oppenheimer, of course, focuses on the race to create the atom bomb near the end of World War II. As scientists for both the Axis powers and the Allies raced for this massive weapon that they hoped would then bring the other to submission. When I was growing up, we had drills in the light of all of this. Used to hide under desks and have raids. How many of you remember that stuff in school? And then as we moved into the 70s and the 80s, as both the West and NATO powers began to have larger and larger stockpiles of nuclear weapons, and the old Soviet bloc had larger and larger blocks of nuclear weapons, people started to wonder, and there were protests, and going, why all this? And then there was an actual strategy that came out that military and political leaders tried to convince the world that the reason that they did this was something called MAD. What a great name, MAD. It sounds mad, doesn't it? Mutually Assured Destruction. The theory was that if we had so many weapons and you had so many weapons, that nobody would dare launch one at the other because it would be the end of everything. The end of everything. And today, the legacy of that continues. One of the great fears as the nation of Ukraine struggles to overcome the illegal and diabolical invasion of the Russians and the reason that the West has sometimes been criticized and in responding too slowly is they know that Russia as a power has a great stockpile of nuclear weapons and the, and the threat has always been if we get involved any further then maybe this will trigger this will trigger something a catastrophe for the world that we'll never recover from and so people worry and they debate over in our history, there's been many, many different opinions on A, the initial use of the atomic bomb, nuclear weapons theory, whether or not we should just unilaterally disarm as a sign of good faith. All of us are concerned about various threats to our world to our way of life, to our well-being. In our darkest moments, they cause us a great deal of angst and stress. We wonder, and we wonder what we should do. We must remember that in all these things, 
No one side is ever totally innocent. Self-interest, pride, affects all nations. Evil is present in our world. What do we do with the problem of evil? It really relates to our text this morning because evil is also a problem for those of us who embrace the goodness of our God and the goodness of his kingdom. What do we do when we confront evil in the world? And the closer you get to understanding God's purposes and God's great love, the more you are agitated by the presence of evil. Most of us become so accustomed to things that are wrong in the world, we ignore it. But God being perfect and holy and just does not ignore such things. What would he do in the face, and what will he do in the face of evil in our world? In these series of parables that we as a people of God have been looking at throughout this summer, we sometimes might wonder, Why, as the disciples did, why did Jesus teach in parables? Why this method? We are fortunate in that Jesus tells us in verses 10 to 17 of Matthew 13. He deliberately adopted this method of teaching in parables at this particular stage of his ministry He says, and it sounds strange, for the purpose of withholding truth from those who weren't willing to hear. Because the crowds had proved themselves to be deaf to his claims and irresponsible to his demands. Reminds me of the Old Testament where we read the worst of all possible curses, where God says that he'll send a famine on the land. And the famine is described as the famine of the absence of the hearing of the word of God. Verse 9 of a chapter says, He who has ears, let him hear. That is directed to us, those who have embraced the gospel and the message of Christ. We who have ears and need to listen. Indeed, he repeats that in verse 43. And it is a verse that is featured in the message to each one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He who has ears, let him hear. This parable is very similar to that of the sower. The big difference is that the soil is the same throughout this parable. Like the parable of the sower, Jesus is pictured as the sower. And it is a very common picture, common especially in the, in the culture in which Jesus lived and something that was known. If you had an enemy and you wanted to really mess them up economically and create hardship, In this kind of agricultural culture, where that was what people relied on, you would destroy their crops. And so we have this parable, traditionally known as the parable of the wheat and the tares. Very misleading, because, well, not in my particular case, because I already shared in a previous week my This is a lack of ability to do gardening and identify things. But most of you can tell the difference in the garden between a plant and a weed, and so we can weed things, etc. But in this parable, the word that we would translate for tares or for the weeds is a very particular word. It's the word for darnell. 
It is a kind of rye grass. A species of the grass family, but poisonous to other grasses. And as you know, wheat is from the grass family. So when they grew up in the field, they looked very much the same. And you really couldn't tell the difference until they reached full maturity. So it was a particularly evil way of interfering with someone you didn't like's crops. Because when you sow darnel among the wheat, they started to grow and you thought, wow, look at that, the wheat's really growing great this year. I think I'm going to have a great crop. I'm going to be able to take it to market. I'm going to be able to feed my family. Only to find out that as it matured and it got near the top and the, and the, the roots had already entangled each other, that the, someone with evil intent had sown these darnel seeds, these weeds among the wheat. These seeds and darnel could also be poisonous not only to plants, but in large quantities to people. So, quite the problem. A real concern for a farmer. The parable starts off simple and easy enough. Jesus, the sower of the word, the seed, goes about and sows it, as we, his followers, ought to do. In response, the good seed starts to grow. The lives of people are changed. The sons of the kingdom and the daughters of the kingdom are born. Those who respond to the good news. They come under Christ's ownership. The word of God begins to show its fruit. In explaining the parable, Jesus says, where do we plant? He says, the field is the world. His vision is grand. Our vision sometimes tends to be local and parochial, but Jesus said, it is wide. Behold, look up and see. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white for harvest, he says in other places. The sower and the field. Everything seems to be going well. This is our Father's world as we sing together in that wonderful hymn. It is his by right, and by him it was made. Nothing that exists has been made without his oversight. So we ought not to despair. But there are others who lay claim to that which is not rightfully theirs. He and his have sown the good seed, and it continues. Habakkuk's grand vision that he paints for us in his wonderful book ought to be ours. The promise that the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters fill the sea. All sounds great, but there is in the spiritual world, just as there is in the physical world, there are saboteurs, those who would seek to do us harm There is an enemy who is active and lethal. His intent is to destroy. When the servants go out and look at the field in the parable and notice that the darnel is among the wheat, they ask the landowner, And in this parable, it's very clear. The people of God 
look to God and look to Christ who is our life and say, what shall we do? Should we go out? Find all those impos- rip them out of the ground? Jesus' answer is interesting. First Peter chapter 5 tells us that the devil's like an adversary prowling about like a lion seeking to devour. He has no claim to the world, but he's antagonistic to the owner. One preacher once said that the devil is a squatter. A squatter is a man who settles in a land that he has no right to, and he works it for his own advantage. There is a greater war in our world than the wars that occupy our headlines, even greater than the conflicts in the Ukraine and those that are engulfing great chunks of the continent of Africa even as we speak. Jesus commanded us to go into the world and to make disciples. There's a famous quote that came out just after the Second World War. I can't remember who it's attributed to. I suppose I should have Googled it before my sermon, but I didn't. But it's one that I remember well, because it's a message to all of us in all spheres of life, whether it be our Christian endeavors or whether it be on the social and political fronts. All that is needed for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. The devil's not going to stop. Evil's not going to stop. At least not during this time until Christ returns. But it's subtle. Darnell's like wheat, but it's false. The devil's method is not always obvious. It's often one of imitation. There are all kinds of theories and social experiments and things out there in the names of tolerance and other, thi- other words all sound so lovely and liberating that all they do is enslave us more. It is subtle. The most dangerous things are subtleties. Half-truths are much more dangerous than blatant lies. Blatant lies are obvious. Half-truths just have enough there to say, hmm, maybe. In the church and in the world, where there ought to only be wheat, there is also Darnell in the midst. What can we do? In the church, there's the subtle activity of the enemy. Perhaps that's why the church has been described by some who, was, who have frustrated at its lack of progress as the only army where the soldiers shoot at each other. There is a tendency to get along, to accommodate to the spirit of the age, when in Rome, do what the Romans do. To let the fundamental truths of the gospel slip. Let us be aware. The servant's response, who loved the landowner, is somewhat understandable. They are enraged. What do we do? Do we go out and we rip it all out? There's a mixed crop. The feelings of the owner, the good field, has become contaminated. Jesus, who gave his own lifeblood for the life of the world, looks at our brokenness with great sadness. We all know the answer to that trivia question. 
What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. I remember my one and only time that I went to Jerusalem. And uh, I was there with a group that uh, we were doing training for a couples program, a, a mental health program that we have at Wounded Warriors Canada. We were training some Israeli professionals, etc. But we had one day of a, of a side trip where we got to go to Jerusalem because we were in Tel Aviv most of the time. And there was one lady whose former job when she was with the Israeli army was being a tour, mass, tour guide. And she knew that the rest of the people on there were kind of interested because there's a little bit of history, but she knew I was the one person on the bus that, uh, that had an overt professed faith. And she came over to me on the bus and she said, you see Jerusalem's up there. What do you think as you see Jerusalem? And I looked over as we went down this highway and there was barbed wire on both sides of the highway. And there were these towers from which guards were overlooking the roadway. My answer was the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. She looked at me, this veteran of the Israeli army, this historian, this person of Jewish heritage, and she said, you know, I'm not a follower of Jesus, but I agree with him. I agree with you. I think he'd cry still. Looks at the world. We want to, our, our gut reaction is to tear out all the Darnell. But the roots are entangled. The church has tried historically with huge failure through inquisitions and other things, through sinners' benches at the fronts of churches, and all kinds of other things in an attempt to, to reflect our holiness, but ending up doing more damage. That old saying, sometimes the cure is worse than the disease. The church is called to be holy, and it ought to cause us grief as believers, those who are committed to Christ, when it's not. Some have used the instrument of, st of the state over and over through our historical history, especially in the West. In 1612, John Smythe, who is the first and regarded as the father of modern-day Baptists. So since it's 1612, he would have been in the Netherlands at the time. And he said this, the magistrate is not by virtue of his office to meddle with religion or matters of conscience, to force or to compel men to do this or that form of religion, but to leave Christian religion free to every man's conscience conscience and only handle civil transgressions, injuries and wrongs of man against man because Christ is the only king and lawgiver of the church and of conscience. Christ in this parable speaks about the realism of the nature of the present age. It's a mixed bag. It's imperfect. The church like history, like human beings, lives like all of us is messy it's messy it is a mixture of that which we inspire to and that which we actually do and think but there's one wonderful message of hope in the midst of this because the good seed is different than any other seed when you plant wheat, you're going to get wheat. When you plant Darnell, you're going to get Darnell. But because of Christ and his grace, an individual who is evil and is planted in the midst of the world or in the church can do what Darnell and nature can never do. 
he can be transformed by the power of the Spirit and the grace of God and move from a son of wrath to a citizen of the kingdom. That's where the gospel comes in. And that is one of the reasons we leave them together. A man who but yesterday was influenced by the prince of the power of the air in the midst of commerce and society and recreation and influence, hindering the kingdom of God, can be blessed by God. He can be changed. He can become a son or daughter of the kingdom. He begin to insert, in, exert the influence with others towards the kingdom of God. The servants are anxious, and so are we. But be reassured, dear friends, his kingdom will come. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Harvest time is coming, and that's where the parable ends. It is a warning against masking or a veil of professed belief. We can fool each other. Heck, I'm even good at fooling myself. But you're not good at fooling God. He cannot be mocked or fooled. Those who spurn Christ and his love and his care for the field will be reserved for judgment, as our parable tells us. Those who labor and are distressed about the state of the world and the church, there is hope. Justice will be found. As Jesus says in this parable, the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom. Christ has planted, and those who have placed their trust in him will shine forth as the saint as the sun when he comes in his kingdom. Who should bring a charge against God's elect, Paul asks in the book of Romans? The answer, of course, is no one. For God is the one who justifies. There is therefore none who can condemn. But the only thing left to do then is to ask yourself, a question. You're planted in the world. And what species of grass are you? Are you wheat? Or do you just kind of look like it? Are you Darnell? We can all be tempted because the world is very tempting. But we must respond to God's word and embrace his love and trust him that indeed the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom. He's coming. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Let us pray. O God of mercy and great love, we come to you this day. Many are our needs and our desire. And in God, may we put our trust and our hope in you. We stand in constant need of your spirit, Father, to sustain and strengthen us. Spirit of God, we ask that you would rule in our hearts and our minds. Reveal to us the glory and the love of Christ. We ask you to fill us with yourself so that empowered we may give witness to the light of Christ in a broken, a dark, and a sinful world. Lord, have mercy on your people and fill us with hope, we pray. In Jesus' matchless and precious name, amen. We have an opportunity to respond in singing. I invite you to rise as you're able as we sing together. How firm a foundation.
foundation. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent word. What more can He say than to you He has said to you who for refuge to Jesus have With you will be not dismayed, for I am your God, and will still give you aid. I'll strengthen you, help you, cause you to stand upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Waters, I call you to go. The rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you, your troubles to bless and sanctify to you your deepest And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit rest and remain with you and those whom you love today, tomorrow, and all your tomorrows. Amen. Oh, for a thousand tongues to say my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace, my gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of
grace of God has reached for